Previously on Adventure Archives, we took you through the beautiful state of California, hiked our way across Zion National Park, reverenced the wonders of the Navajo Nation, and wandered through Albuquerque. Now, in the conclusion of our three-part road trip special, we head to the Deep South. We've traveled thousands of miles, but there are thousands to go as we explore the wilderness of Texas, the history of the southern plantations, the bayous of Louisiana, and more. Join us on this final chapter of our road trip adventure as we make our way back home. Through the night and into the morning, powerful gales rolled across the vast open plains of Tucumcari. It was here that we camped after exploring the southwest, and in spite of all the wind, we managed to get a decent amount of rest. Yo, were you able to sleep with all of the I have no clapping? clue how, but I was lying on my back. I couldn't sleep at all, but if I lied on my side, and put my pillow over my face and put my sleeping bag over my face. <laughs> I was just pretending like I was listening to some heavy rock music and just trying to get to sleep. Where are we even right now? <laughs> Tucumcari, New Mexico. We left the barren KOA campground, headed up Route 66, stopped in at a local diner for breakfast, and went on our way. Vast windmills were scattered across all of eastern New Mexico, taking advantage of the forceful winds that ripped across the surrounding fields. Just the other day, we had been surrounded by mesas and rock formations, but now there was a boundless expanse of farmland and pastures. We saw herds of grazing cattle and hawks soared across the open skies. Before long, we crossed over the border into West Texas. The landscape here was just as flat and expansive, but the winds had picked up and a sandstorm swept across the roads. The sky turned a dark ochre color as thick plumes of dust blotted out the sun. And along with the peculiar weather, we saw this peculiar dog on the back of a truck bed. After hours of driving, the sand and meadows were replaced by green trees and rolling hills. A light sprinkling of rain fell from the clouds above as we entered Austin, Texas. Here, we were grabbing dinner with some special friends local to the area, the State Parkers. Yeah, let's go feed these boys. We were headed to a restaurant that was voted best sushi in town, and also happened to be where Clint and Melody worked. Another thing you might need to know is the bartender is smiling at us right now because she's oh. my wife and oh. she is very looking forward to meeting all of you oh folks. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the crew. After saying hi to Clint and Melody, we cracked open some beers and ordered some food. His mother was my second Nothing like some sushi and hot sake after a nine hour drive. So usually I'm a sushi purist, but they have something called the Texan, and we're in Texas and I feel like I gotta get it. Because I've lived in California and everyone has had a California roll in their life. I've never had a Texan roll in my life, so let's try this out. Okay. <laughs> Very crunchy, which is really good. Mm. I'll eat your tail. <laughs> we all chatted over sushi, booze, and pork katsu. 
god. <laughs> when I lived in Japan, my host mother would make katsu, pork katsu, just like this, with the same sauce. This tastes just like it. delicious. In fact, I'm gonna feed some to Andrew right now. And want to do it so. That was really amazing. There you go. Good stuff, right? <laughs> and Thomas went a little overboard with the sashimi. I need, I need to try the chef's special. The chef makes a menu, and there's like an artistic flair to it. You gotta try what you want. I'm with you. I'm with you. Then Clinton Melody filled us in on tomorrow's plans. Considering the short period amount of time we have together, and we could have gone downtown and done the whole city thing, but it's not what we all have in mind. Right we now. talked about it so much. We were like. Do we show them outdoors or do we show them Austin? Like, what are they gonna like better? I think you made the right choice. After taking some photos for this memorable occasion, it was back to their place where Brian and Clint had a bit of a jam session while we all hung out and goofed off. Oh, I'm just filming you filming him. Oh. This is the filming <laughs> me, filming you, filming him. There's, you get the right side of his face, I'll get the left side of his face. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is cool. Oh, wait, Brian's getting <laughs> just like yeah, this. Yeah. This is behind the behind the scenes. <laughs> and for posterity's sake, we all signed the State Parker's copy of Outside Magazine that we had both been featured in. Nice. The next day, we packed our bags, filed out, and crammed ourselves all into one car. We arrived at Reimer's Ranch and were greeted by some beautiful wildflowers and some fascinating cacti. What we know is pencil cactus. You gotta be careful walking through this stuff. It doesn't look that harmless, but it'll catch a ride on your pants and you won't know it's there. And then you'll go sit down and you'll get a cactus thorn in your butt. We find these a lot on rock ledges when we're scrambling over hills and we encounter this stuff and it's kind of like hard to scramble around it. But I'm guaranteeing one of them is gonna get some pencil cactus on. We saw some of the pencil cactus fruits and some flowering prickly pear cacti. We hiked into a flowing meadow speckled with colorful wildflowers. Then, the trail took us into a cavernous gully. Water collected here, feeding a different community of plants. Up there in the grasslands, we saw a lot of blue bonnets and a lot of other wildflowers. And the blue bonnet is actually Texas's state flower. And Clint informed us that you're actually not allowed to pick those. But here in this like sort of watery, riparian area, we've got sycamore trees, which are water loving. There's one behind us, which has really the distinct white bark. And we've also got a bunch of ferns growing, like maidenhair ferns. And also there's uh, Virginia creeper and poison ivy, which are some familiar vining plants from the Midwest but you only want to touch one of those, obviously. And above, ball mosses clung to barren tree limbs. So even though a lot of the wildflowers were up in that grass area, I do notice some scarlet penstemones clinging to the rocks on the side of this river area. Really cool. As we went deeper into the ravine, we saw climbers dangling from the rock face above. Moss-covered limestone stalagmites and stalactites dripped with water adding to the uniqueness of this Texan landscape. Further ahead, Andrew and Clint talked about more of the plants that surrounded us. I was walking through here and I was like, what is this plant? And I realized it's just a really overgrown poison ivy vine just like dangling over like a tree branch. Almost. So I don't want my face to go you in. You do not want your face to go in that. <laughs> this is not box elder situation. And then over there, you've got a huge, what, cypress tree? Right? It looks like a cypress tree, but it, it, it also, it almost looks cypress. like it's a mix between a cypress, an oak, and a juniper. <laughs> and then here, I'm seeing all these vines that I don't recognize, but this one is definitely in the briar family. I don't know if it's one of the edible species, but I know there's species back home where the tender tips of the vines can be snapped off and eaten. Tangle roots slithered across the ground as we continued. And Andrew saw more plants that reminded him of home. We've got an elm here, which actually grows in the Midwest, but uh, I feel like I don't actually see it all that often when I'm out in the woods. 
but you can tell it's an elm because it's got this sort of fuzzy texture and the base of the leaf does not line up with each other. There's like a, a little bit of it that overhangs. How many times have you guys been out here? Four or five? Yeah. We usually go it. a different trail every time. This is it. our favorite because it's just so, you start off in this and then you have like a view out that way. And yeah, like yeah, yeah. Rock wall on this side and then you make it to the river. And you have the option to get in or not. Are you getting in today? It might be a little cold. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I, I would like to, but I don't Yesterday, know, Yesterday, I would have been like, yes. Yeah, today. Maybe we'll get Once warmer, we get out in the open, the sun's Yeah, it might get warmer, warmer, so. Loose rock. We hiked deeper into the woods and spotted the odd false day flower, which has two lavender-colored petals, as well as some unfurling fern fronds. Then we entered an almost swampy area with more cypress trees. They grow around the rivers around here, this, but they're really prominent in the Guadalupe River. They do have a very certain beauty about them. Yeah, they almost look like video game trees that you have to hop from one. They're just so perfectly placed. Like Ewoks would live in those. Yeah. yeah. Is this what they were expecting Texas to look like? This is not what I expected Texas to look like at all. Especially after being in the Southwest, we expected Texas to be flat, sandy, and barren. But our expectations were being completely debunked. What we had found instead was a lush, wooded environment full of greenery. The canopy above was accompanied by colorful wildflowers below. But in addition to the wildflowers were some cacti clinging to boulders. Oh, there's some climber stuff up here. Yeah. Wind is a little bit terrifying. Not as bad as uh, Angel's Landing. <laughs> That's true. If we fall, we'll probably be alive. It'll hurt. Now, we emerged from the forest and made our way to the sun-soaked floodplains of a bright blue river. Yeah, that would be the uh, Pertinalis River, and that snakes and winds all the way through when the Memorial Day floods happened in Austin four years ago. We were in a severe drought. Our lake had almost completely dried up. It almost, like our big lake looked like that. Memorial Day floods came through, washed out 30 or 40 homes, killing a lot of people in Wimberley, Texas. But the Memorial Day flood came back, filled up our lake, and now all these rivers are feeding into that lake and it's keeping it kind of steady. Uh, but we're back in a drought again, so we need some more rain up north so it trickles down the lower Colorado River. Here, I came across an interesting plant. I would guess that it was in the pea family based on how the leaves are branching, but the compound leaf looks a lot like black locusts back home. But this racing of flowers, it, it's throwing me off. It doesn't really look like something you'd see on a pea plant, so we'll let the narrator fill us in. <laughs> As it turns out, this was Amorpha fruticosa, the desert false indigo. Native to these parts, it is indeed part of the pea family. The trail had led us to the edge of the water. We found a nice rocky area along the riverbank to rest, enjoy the scenery, and have some lunch. After enjoying some breakfast tacos, we all reflected on the hike thus far. I think of Texas to think of like big expanses of brown and yellow desert, but this is just like bright greens and blue water. And, and yeah, yeah, especially considering what we drove for the majority of yesterday. Yeah, Absolutely. just yeah. well, that's why I was kind of insistent when I was talking. I was like, "Look, guys, you're missing out if you don't pop down and detour through Austin. If you just do that Texas stint, you're always going to think of Texas as J.R. Ewing and Urban Cowboy, and that's yeah. it." It's like an oasis. Yeah. So much greenery. It's just like the Midwest with a little bit more hills. Yeah. yeah. Paradise. You're in the heart of the hill country right now. Um, our, our tallest peaks out here are like 2,000. We've come across some spots where it was like, We had oh to God. like <laughs> drag each other up. <laughs> now, does this ever get dry? Yeah. Wow. Yes. If it rains in Austin, all that water goes south. It has to rain two and a half hours north of us. Down and recharge that reservoir that it can then flow down through Austin. So this is the Pertinalis River? Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, Willie Nelson 
lives oh, off yeah. of the Purdue Mountains River. Ah, I was wondering why it was so smoky around here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nearby, we saw some foamy froghopper nests, some brown cockleburs, and blue curl flowers. We made our way across a rocky ravine and continued on the trail. And Clint found another wildflower that gave this landscape some of its vibrant color. The Indian paintbrush here seems to be more vibrant and, and a little bit more fun to look at. But according to Andrew, they're edible. So if we ever needed to survive out here in the spring, it's a good time to do it. The petals look bigger than the ones I've seen out in like Montana, Wyoming, and California. In the sky above, a vulture soared in the wind. We made our way across more of the limestone boulders that were scattered along the trail. Up ahead, we found a huge thistle flower. We've got a thistle here. I know that a lot of thistle species are edible. I'm sure this one is too if you remove all the spines. But actually artichokes are a form of a thistle. They're just like basically a giant one. And if you go to a place where they grow artichokes, you'll see flowers just like these. But yeah, I've got many a childhood memory of like sitting on a little thistle leaf as a kid and wondering why my butt hurt so much. <laughs> but I think the ones in Ohio are less spiny than this. There are a handful of thistle species in Texas. This one was the nodding thistle. Nearby was a massive boulder where we tested our climbing skills. Yeah, I don't know where you would go. On the rock were signs of past climbers, chalk dusted handholds and pitons. So to be a climber, that's like an entirely different breed of person. One of the things you really need to just kind of accept when you're climbing is because of all the holes and stuff and the route that you take up, sometimes we get some little friends that you gotta watch out for. Also near the boulders were smooth down old tree stumps. It was great climbing atop the boulders and seeing the landscape from above. After a little bit, we continued hiking. A gentle breeze rolled through the grass around us as we continued along the dirt path. We wound off the path and found ourselves amid a stony expanse just by the river. It suddenly got really bright with all these white stones. It's like a completely different sort of landscape suddenly. Just all this bright white limestone. This area definitely had a mysterious quality about it. back there, it looked like the current was going that way. But in fact, the wind on top is just blowing this way, so the river is actually flowing to the north. And in addition to the strange flow of the river, we found a cypress sapling growing from an old, worn down stump. In the water, a great egret was enjoying some fresh fish for lunch. On the ground, we found some chert and some shells. Now, with the sun out, it was time to take off our shoes and test the waters. Oh man, it feels amazing. Especially after being out west, it feels so nice to be back somewhere where it's green and wet. And as if this day couldn't get any more idyllic, a rainbow-colored cirrus cloud, or a circumhorizontal arc, appeared in the sky.
After a while, we returned to the path, making our way back to the trailhead. Along the way, we came across an interesting tree. Melody was kind enough to point out the mesquite tree here, and I love cooking with mesquite. You actually take it from the wood chips of the tree itself, and we found this on the on the ground here and just snapped it open. It's kind of got a sweet smell to it. Want to smell? Got to really inhale. You got to really inhale. <laughs> All right, you're definitely not driving us home. <laughs> yeah, it smells. I can smell. You can kind of smell this mesquite. Here, you want to? Yes. Yeah. So these are red. Are these uh, fire ants? These are a little different. They're, they're like workers, but they're called carpenter ants. Now, that being said, if they bite you, you feel it. I don't know if it hurts quite as bad as a fire ant, but it stings about as bad as a, a small bee sting. So who's volunteering? <laughs> The final portion of the path led us through a meadow where vibrant cactus flowers bloomed and silver strands of grass swayed in the wind. We saw some prickly pear flowers, an agarita shrub, clusters of pincushion cacti, and antelope horn milkweed. overlooked the Pedernales River one last time before heading out for lunch at a nearby Tex-Mex place. What's a michelada? So it's like tomato juice with beer and... Worcestershire sauce, salt, lime. I don't know the person who was like, I'm gonna make a drink out of tomato juice and Worcestershire sauce. It had to be a desperate man with not much in his pantry. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta improvise a little. Cloves, pie crust, Tom Collins mix. I'm glad you guys all stayed. I'm so glad you all are here. And after some drinks and a wonderful meal, it was time to part ways. Okay, see you guys. Bye. Yes. Yeah. Right, thanks so much. Much love. Texas, we'll miss you. <laughs> All right, rolling out. Now, we drove further east and we stopped along the way to fuel up and have a sweet treat originally from Texas. So, Clint and Melody were telling us about Bluebell ice cream. We've got a chocolate and a vanilla. Okay, I gotta say that immediately the vanilla flavor is really, really strong and really good. Oh yeah, that's the same with chocolate, I think. Is that vanilla also? Mm -hmm. oh, it's been a long time since I've had really good vanilla ice cream. This grater's not, grater's from Ohio not good enough? <laughs> I, just, I don't know. Are you too good for graters? <laughs> just be like, graters is, uh, it's not great. Bad. <laughs> it's gooders. <laughs> it's okayers. <laughs> and then we were off for our next destination. So, on our way out of Texas, we're going to make a stop to visit the one and only Tim V, the Texan camper, aka Trail Aesthetics. That's right. We're one minute away from his house. He said that he has throat rippingly cold beers waiting oh, for us. <laughs> Our bodies are ready. We got Andrew on the internet, and oh. Andrew in real life. Oh my goodness! That handsome devil. <laughs> look, look who's this handsome devil right here. That's Batman right there. <laughs> Swear to me. <laughs> oh I man. Help myself. Oh, that is so great, dude. Why not? You know, all out the red carpet. Oh, it feels Damn. so nice too. Wow. This is a beautiful house and backyard, by the way. Thank you so much. Awesome. Presentation is all about presentation. And Tim had some nice food for us it's to like, enjoy. It's like biting into a cloud. This is bruschetta. <laughs> is that really nice? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, that's correct. <laughs> this is in my mouth, is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's salty, so be prepared. It's addictive. If you if you if you like the flavors, it can become very addictive. This is Just incredible. Going and going and going and going. You said your wife made this, or? Yeah, she makes that. The freshness of the tomato and the basil, with the um, cheese flavor. <laughs> I'm sure nobody knows what a Corona tastes well, I just, like. Just the combination, you know, <laughs> the contrast as we say. 
It's like a taste of Mexico. Do you want one, Brian? I'll share Then we played some games together. Salt turtles with acid breath and Lance Armstrong's missing t- That's pretty good. This just killed us, dude. it has got five, one, one. This is the half of zero over here. Thomas. No humor over here. Thomas had the perfect poker face there. There you go. He psyched me out on that one. And after playing, drinking, and having some laughs, we chit-chatted for a little while longer. By the way, water boils faster at higher altitudes. I know. I, oh, See, that look at snap that. Is, no. Have you, you know, publicly admitted that? That you is actually. Wrong. I didn't think about that. I've yeah. publicly admitted that. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have concluded that we have the greatest viewers and fans in the world. <laughs> Everyone's been so awesome. Yeah, it's incredible. It's also cool to think about how many people we've actually met along the way. Yeah. Like this is a not meetup. just been an experience of places, but people. Okay, so next stop, a random hotel in the random middle of nowhere. That's right. Now, we were off to our next location, a random hotel in Mont Bellevue. Don't let the exterior fool you. This is a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> We were happy to leave the motel, as we had spent the night in our sleeping bags after finding mysterious stains on the sheets. And then, we were off. Next stop, New Orleans. New Orleans! We crossed in Louisiana, which had the most greenery and water we had seen since Big Sur. We drove across massive causeways that passed over wetlands and rivers. And we saw a slab car with elbow swinger rims an example of slab car culture originating in Houston. We exited the highway and soon arrived at Oak Alley Plantation. Turn left onto Louisiana 18 West. Originally built in 1837, this place got its name from its beautiful live oaks. Though this lesser known cat was also a beauty to behold. After Thomas checked us in, we got some special lemonade. It's slushy. Mm. Yeah. Then Thomas and Brian left to get the keys to our cabin. Hi guys. Bon voyage. Thomas. Thomas is doing all the work for us. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Beautiful big oak trees. They returned and informed us that tonight would be particularly decadent. This is going to be very different than Adventure Archives, uh -huh. typically. I mean... We arrived at our cabin, which was really more of a fully furnished house. This is literally the opposite of Adventure Archives. <laughs> There's our food right there. Nice. The food came in plastic microwavable containers, which seemed a bit odd. But once it was all served on a plate, it looked pretty good. We had seafood and chicken gumbo, seafood au gratin, red beans and sausage, vegetables, and crawfish etouffee. Good. So it started out a little bit underwhelming, but it looks pretty good now <laughs> yeah. that it's all out here. Yeah. I'm going to pour myself the first julep. Mint yeah, julep, not lemon julep. To adventure. To the south. Yeah. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> to the union. <laughs> <laughs> to the union. <laughs> That's, that's pretty good, it's strong. <laughs> yeah, it's really strong. This is something I would never have even thought of doing on my own. But now that we're here, this is super cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad you like it because there's two reasons I wanted to head to the Deep South. I feel like a lot of media portrays it in a way that's very backwatery. I don't think that's fair to kind of base it off what the media says. So I want to go down here and try this. kind of check out some of it myself. I think another reason is it's just such a culture I'm not familiar with. Deep South. The environment here is so beautiful, and the live oaks. It's beautiful weather today, beautiful sunshine, but at the same time, there's this dark history. It's so weird because at the time, this place probably wasn't any less beautiful. It was probably super beautiful, and people could live in that dichotomy of owning other people mm -hmm. and having all this beautiful land and being okay with that. Yeah, and I think one thing we have to remember, all of the beauty and all of the wealth that went into maintaining the place, it's, it's from slave labor. And it's important that people remember the past and learn from it. The South is a highly misunderstood place, often considered backwards, 
and ignorant. But this is an unfair generalization, often rooted in stereotypes about poor white people. At the same time, slavery has had a reverberating effect on our society to this day. And it's important to acknowledge the real, lasting impact it has on black communities. Equally important is to keep in mind that during times of the slave trade, racism was used to justify both the exploitation of slaves and poor whites. By turning people against each other on the basis of race, those who owned the biggest farms and plantations were able to keep everyday people, black and white, from coming together in unity to fight for their liberation. After our meal, we decided to have some coffee to perk us up a bit and lighten the mood. Ah, nothing like a good coffee after a meal. Ah, my good gentleman. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Ah. Cheers. Pan pants here is too stuck up to <laughs> toast with me. There you go. <laughs> you don't actually put your feet up on the table. It's very rude. <laughs> don't mind if I do. <laughs> While Southern etiquette might be lost on us, we did want to tour the plantation to learn more about it. Andrew and I split off to see the plantation's natural wonders. Meanwhile, Robbie and I went to learn about its history. Dude, look at this. Like, it never ceases to amaze me how people can treat other human beings. It's absurd, man. I guess once you have it in your mind that someone is subhuman, it makes it much more acceptable to do that. Yeah. So apparently the uh, slave uh, Antoine, I don't, I guess they didn't say his last name because maybe slaves just weren't granted last yeah, names, yeah. but he's apparently known for grafting um, a pecan tree, but apparently what it was is that pecans were originally very hard and hard to crack, so he was able to graft one that had thinner shells and made them commercially viable. Oh. But his accomplishments were, you know... Considered his masters yeah. and not his. But at least now he's remembered. Yeah. Posthumously. And in a nearby shack, there were more artifacts of history. Nearby was a map that showed certain counties had more slaves than they did free people, highlighting just how much those with land depended upon slaves to build their wealth. And on a wall were the slave names of those who once toiled on this land. You know, it's really easy to judge them, and they should be judged, don't get me wrong, what they were doing was terrible, but it makes me think about what are we going to be judged for in the future that we think is perfectly normal now, but will look like barbarians to people in the future. That's true. It's kind of funny, maybe they knew what they were doing was wrong in the same way we know some of the things we're doing are wrong. Yeah. But it's like so much part of the culture already, it's hard to change. It's important to learn history, not just to understand the past, but to reflect on what we as a society are doing today and how that will affect the future. Unless we examine the past and think critically about what needs to be changed today and how we can change it, history is rendered useless. Can you imagine if this was just like a place where you lived with all of your friends instead of slaves? Yeah. <laughs> like how much more fun could we be having as humanity as a whole if we were working together to have fun instead of working together to make each other's lives miserable? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Today, we already produce enough food to feed everyone. We have more empty houses than we do homeless people. We have to wonder, are we misusing all the beautiful, wonderful things we have at our disposal? We were glad that, at least today, people of all races could enjoy the beauty of this plantation and its antique trees. At the start of this trip, it was basically just a desert, like, wasteland. Yeah. And now we're surrounded by trees that are like as big as a car. <laughs> this must be like a real shock for Thomas. 
it's because yeah. he's been in California for so long. All this greenery is just like, <laughs> his eyes are gonna start bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> While the others learned about the plantation's history, Andrew and I explored its natural wonders, namely the live oaks from which it gets its name. A dragonfly swayed upon oak leaves in the breeze, and the evening's light cast the grass around us in a warm glow. As we stood in reverence of the massive trees, we reflected on the plantation's history. When I look at the trees, all I see is benevolence. Like, I, I see this ancient creature that is innocent, and it's just this, this being that is something above us, you know? I think that's why this is so beautiful. Yeah. In a way, it feels unsettling that a place that evokes such a violent and shameful part of our history is, now, to us, a beautiful place to enjoy the day and relax. But it's hard not to relax when you're surrounded by nature. Go into nature, and you'll see that the wild and the animals that roam these grounds pay no mind to our borders or our laws or rules. Nature is a great way to escape from the worst aspects of our society. But nature also carries lessons about how we might strive to better our society and improve conditions for all. The evening cast everything into a golden light, and we decided to meet up at the Mississippi River to watch the sunset. Mississippi was just as vast and beautiful as we had all imagined it from stories we read as kids. We saw a massive barge surging across the water, hauling tons of goods. And in the opposite direction came a cruise ship, whose crown-shaped smokestack seemed fitting for its name the American Queen. After watching the sunset, we headed back to the plantation. The plantation seemed even more beautiful, glowing in the dark of night and surrounded by a solemn silence. But back in the cabin, we were raising a ruckus with live guitar music and bubbling water from the hot tub. And to accompany us in the hot tub, some chilled mint juleps. <laughs> oh man, that feels so good. Here's to feeling good all the time. <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> <laughs> Decadence. <laughs> like, what's going on here? <laughs> Just push it. I've got elephantitis. <laughs> we haven't even meaningful to say right now. Is that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll think of something. <laughs> Sometimes, silence is all that needs to be said. <laughs> the key to a happy life is to take advantage of all of your opportunities, mm. even if they're not exactly the way you want them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, you got a jacuzzi and you don't use that jacuzzi? What are you even doing? Cheers to that! 
you got a picture of mint julep and you don't drink it, what are you even doing? Cheers to that. <laughs> you might not have a loving partner around, but at least you've got a friend. Why not share the jacuzzi? Cheers to that. <laughs> You've got a camera with a wide-angle lens. Why not film yourself sharing that jacuzzi and share it with thousands of people? Cheers for that! <laughs> Brian! Thomas! You gotta get in on this! <laughs> There's room for two more! <laughs> and bring the mint julep! <laughs> we need some more! <laughs> in a place where so much suffering and anguish has happened, it was nice to have a moment of levity and laughter. As the night sky rolled by overhead, we enjoyed a comfortable night's rest inside. The next day, we went to the Plantation's restaurant for a complimentary breakfast. We had some coffee, of course, some luxurious crawfish omelets, and beignets covered with sugarcane syrup. Oh man, that's like the lightest, fluffiest, crispy donut. It's like a cumulonimbus cloud. <laughs> that's not overly sweet, like a, like an elephant ear is. Wow. Wow. After an indulgent morning, it was time to get back into nature. Today, we were getting out onto the bayou. After the guides reviewed safety and told us where the gators were hiding, we suited up and paddled out. We're good? Yeah, we are good. Guys, thank you so much. I feel so happy to be back in a canoe. It's like, it's such a graceful way to travel. I mean, you just make these subtle movements in the water and the boat just turns the way you want it to. Everything's so peaceful when you're on the river. Like, even though there's cars nearby, it just feels like we're in the raw of the wilderness right now. When was the last time you canoed, Thomas? With you guys, Algonquin. I was just thinking about how when you first get on the canoe, there's just a little bit of apprehension, but start to settle in, you get really comfortable with the water and the paddling, and it's just always so relaxing, so great. We came upon a fork in the river and decided to go our separate ways. So it splits and meets back up? Yeah. See you in a bit. So right now we are going through a fairly narrow part of the river that's kind of thick. I feel like we're a little on edge just because we've heard all these stories and legends of alligators, you know, and two in Ohio and we think every log is an alligator and every patch of vegetation is also full of alligators. <laughs> and maybe every branch hanging over us has a uh, deadly snakes that'll fall into our boat. But, but at the same time, this is such a peaceful scenic area that it's, it's hard to feel too worried about all that right now. And we just heard something, but I really think that when you're out here, the dangers of the wilderness are much more exaggerated than they actually are. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be safe and you shouldn't be aware of how to treat the wilderness and how to respect it, but it's also just super peaceful. All right, so I think compared to Algonquin, which is just a series of lakes, the bayou is actually pretty shallow, which really kind of makes sense because you can't get much lower than sea level. Mm -hmm. I hear something over there. How's the paddling so far? Feels good. I like paddling canoes a lot. And I do feel like over the course of the episodes we've filmed, I have gotten better at navigating with a canoe. Mm. Especially one person. <laughs> <laughs> you guys okay? Yeah, hold on. It seemed Thomas and I got the rougher prong of the fork. Hit some logs. I got another log here, dude. Yeah, no. That should be it for once we clear that. We're all clear now, I think. That's it. 
Is that them up there? Is that the vegetation they were talking about that we can't get past? Yo, yo, stop, 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 pause, 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 get, get right, get right, get right. Um, man, the right side? Yep. Stop. And we soon came across more obstacles. Yo, Gator. They just paddle us hard in camp. At this point, we're just kind of using the vegetation to pull ourselves. Well, I don't want to get caught in here either. Yeah. They said we could power through this. If they said so, then we can do it. If they believe in us, I do too. Paddling through the vegetation was kind of like pushing a car with a flat tire. But eventually we made our way through. There we go. There we go. Almost there. Almost there. Woo! That was awesome. There's all these water skimmers in the water too. How was it? It was dense, but uh... It was fun. It was really just that last part that was super dense. I said use your hip muscles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> your thrusting muscles. <laughs> How was yours? Pretty clear, smooth? Yeah. It could not have been any clearer and smoother. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it wasn't that bad, honestly. It's just there were logs underneath that we would scrape up against and get stuck on sometimes. Mm. But. Any uh, animal encounters? Nope, not yet. But it seemed one of the tours we caught up with did have some animal encounters. We, uh, caught, they have it down there, so oh. it's a green snake that lives in the trees. Oh, awesome. awesome, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry. He's had a lot of handling, so he must be really good off by now. <laughs> It didn't take long for us to see animals ourselves. All around us were snakes, turtles, and birds, like this osprey in its nest. And in the water below, we saw some beautiful water lilies. Spanish moss was dangling from the cypress trees. And along the way, I saw the distinct leaves and sausage-shaped flowers of the genus Typha, or cattails. Usually when I find typhus, it's just in a way too polluted area, full of like pesticides, because uh, cattails actually absorb a lot of like heavy metals and toxins, which is why wetlands are so important to our waterways. But I'm willing, I, I would bet out here it's a little cleaner of water. I don't know, maybe not. But I did have it when I was in camp one time as a kid and it tasted really good. And I wish I, I could eat them more often, but I don't want to get cancer. <laughs> Everywhere, the landscape of the bayou was distinctly characteristic. The tall trees and the moss were just part of what gave it its swampy look. So I'm not exactly sure what type of trees these are with all the moss hanging off, but I imagine it's some sort of a cypress. And down towards the roots, you can see these sort of knobbly looking knees sticking out of the water. And from what I've read, scientists aren't actually sure what the purpose of those are, but there's some theories that maybe it helps them get extra oxygen or something like that. But you, you see that a lot with cypress trees growing in the swamps and stuff. Okay, we've got a special treat to eat on the bayou. Had some boiled peanuts. And actually, interestingly enough, it's not only a very southern food, but uh, our parents who are from Taiwan originally, they eat this all the time. But yeah, so I actually grew up eating these and I love them. Not Cajun flavored, but still. All right, let's try it. Oh, mine doesn't have any peanuts. Oh, there it is. There's a half a peanut in mine. <laughs> well, these are great. The flavor's so strong. It's the Cajun flavor. These are Cajun flavored. <clears throat> Woo! Nice and salty. And, they're yeah. salty and soft, wow. Yeah, that's what I love about boiled peanuts, is they're soft and juicy almost. Yeah. Yeah, they got that spicy Cajun that kick. Cajun kick. Yeah. <laughs> More of a kick than my last Whoa. one. Yeah, that one had a kick too. I could get used to this. <laughs> <laughs> After our snack, we kept paddling and saw some bird boxes. So I believe the boxes are where little animals and critters come in, but I don't know exactly why they had those up. 
My understanding was that it was bird boxes, but sometimes other critters just get in there. Cause it, it looks like it had a little hole in the front for a bird, but... They do say snakes sometimes get in there and sometimes they'll find them inside. Yeah, that's kind of like the hole from Indiana Jones. <laughs> Stick your hand in there and <laughs> unknown terrorists come out. That's kind of what like, at least our perception of this land kind of feels like sometimes. Like it's so peaceful, but at the same time, there's this slight worry that there's an alligator hiding in the bushes. <laughs> I kind of look at it the same way like you do flight attendants. If the flight attendants aren't panicking, then you don't have any reason to panic. So like if the guides are not panicking, we're good. I'm constantly aware of how much I love canoeing, but when I actually canoe, I become even more aware of just how much it's one of my favorite things in life. I think it's like a feeling of freedom being out on the water too. And there's something about the graceful movement of the boat with the subtlest movements of the oar. It's really satisfying. You just have to make sure you have a partner that tells you exactly what to do or lets you take over sometimes. Sorry, I just love paddling. You can paddle if you want. No, no, you made yourself clear. <laughs> and so, Thomas took full advantage of my hogging the paddle. Floating down the river, in the bayou. How's it going there, Thomas? You look like you've entered next level of relaxation. This is, I, I'm actually a lot happier now. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, watch out, Rob. Can't imagine why. Oh, jeez! Oh, jeez, Rick! <laughs> So one thing I've noticed about here, we've been driving through the Southwest and through the Texas and a lot of the bird sounds sounded different out there, but here I'm starting to hear a lot more familiar sounds. Like I'm hearing a lot of uh, red-winged blackbirds, which have like this sort of gurgly song. And uh, those birds, they love to just nest around water and kind of perch up on like reeds and stuff. And I don't know, it's such a nostalgic sound to me. Because even back in Ohio, if you're around a pond with a lot of cattails and reeds, you'll find red-winged blackbirds, and you'll hear them in the distance singing. It was interesting seeing landscapes and hearing sounds that were a little bit more familiar the closer we got to home. But of course, there were still aspects of the environment that felt alien to us. So we've been canoeing around here, and we came up to this place where all the grass is flat, and it's right next to the river, the bayou here. And it makes sense that this is a place that the gators might hang out. It gives them easy access, and it goes kind of way back there. But look, just look at how flat all the grass is here. And this might be real gator area. After exploring around a bit, we got back into the main waterway. In the distance, two ominous trunks stood tall. And then, lying in the vegetation, we finally saw it. An alligator. We admired the gator from a safe distance, paddled on by, and talked about what we had just seen. Thankfully, these monsters had been pretty docile and allowed us to pass them by. You could put like a replica alligator out here and nobody would ever know. <laughs> Yeah, that's so funny, because I was looking, I said, this doesn't even look real. This looks more like a statue of an alligator. It looked a lot like a toy alligator. Like, it's funny how accurate the details from a kid playing with the alligator toy is to real life. You think alligators are scary creatures, then you just see it sitting there bathing in the sun, and you realize that it's just living its own life, you know? It just, it just kind of wants to be left alone and enjoy the weather just like we do. I'm also just so glad that we got to see one because if you come to the bayou, you really want to see that distinct animal of this sort of environment. And it's just so cool seeing something that's like straight out of prehistory. Those have to be like leftovers from the dinosaur age, right? I think when uh, Spanish settlers first came here, they couldn't believe it. They thought they were these monsters. So when they'd write back, they'd say there were giant monsters that lived in the rivers down here. We soon paddled our way into Lake Pontchartrain. This was actually an estuary, where the fresh water of the river mixes with the salt water of the ocean. And out here, the water was a lot more choppy, in part due to the unhindered winds. We decided to dock at a sandy bank to enjoy the scenery and have a snack. Since we had stayed at a plantation famous for its pecans, we were having a homemade pecan pie and a pecan praline. 
Ready? Dink it and sink it. Mmm, that's good. Mmm. <laughs> Sweeter than I expected. It's got a nice little like texture or a creamy texture inside. This praline is the most decadent thing I've ever tasted. It tastes exactly how you would imagine it to taste. Mm. I have to say, pecan mm. pie is one of my favorite pies for sure. Mm -mm. Pretty tasty, man. Mm. Anything that comes in something like this, you know it's gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's that bridge we went over to. Yeah. Can you imagine lying out here at night and seeing the lights all lit up in the distance? Oh. That'd be so cool. It'd be cool to camp here, I'd just be really scared. <laughs> you wake up and an alligator is yeah, next yeah, to you yeah. and you're spooning it. <laughs> All around us, the bayou was teeming with life. And in the distance, New Orleans could be seen across the bay. We got in our canoes and paddled back up the bayou. This time, we got an even closer look at a couple of gators bathing in the sun. initially been so afraid of the alligators. So often, we think of nature, including human nature, as being inherently violent, competitive, and aggressive. But there are so many examples of nature, animals, and people getting along, cooperating, and living in peace with each other. In a place brimming with as much life as the bayou of Louisiana, it becomes a little easier to appreciate that fact. Oh, okay. Now, after our canoe journey, we stopped at a Cajun and Creole restaurant for a hearty New Orleans meal. I got some sort of local sour beer. It's delicious, it's called Purple Haze. I've said before that ghosts and sour beers objectively taste like you vomited up fruit, but I still really like them a lot. <laughs> I got a wheat beer made locally. It's good, it's got like a lot of different aftertastes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> wow, it almost tastes like grapefruit juice or something. On the menu today sausage was gumbo. some sausage gumbo, mm. oh. delicious raw oysters, and alligator. some blackened alligator. Slightly springier chicken. Yeah, it's got a slightly <coughs> seafoody gamey taste. Mm, I like it. It's like a rainbow meat. It like keeps changing the more I chew it. it starts with chicken, ends up as beef, then pork. Next the boudin balls. I've got rice, pork heart, and pork liver. Very, very unique taste, but very good. It's got the rice in it with the meat, so it's like a meal inside of a fried ball. I could eat a lot of these. <laughs> then, the biggest, most affordable oysters I've ever had. Oysters. Could you dress this the way you would recommend? Just a little bit of that. Just a little bit of each. And then I'm gonna put some lemon on it. This is the biggest oyster I've ever seen in my life. When I first started eating raw oysters, I feel like I like the idea more than the actual food, but now I just, I don't know, it, the taste is so refreshing. That's not what you would think of when you think of a raw oyster, but mm. it's just refreshing, it tastes like the sea. Delicious. So I put a little Tabasco sauce on mine because Tabasco sauce is yeah. a Louisiana hot sauce. Just tilt it back. Yeah. Suck it up. It's really fresh, like Andrew was saying. But most people are scared of the weird sliminess of it, but are pretty good. I've never had a raw oyster. We shall see. No smell. A 
put too much horseradish on there, so I couldn't really taste it. The texture is still not my favorite. You wanna try another? No. <laughs> I don't wanna waste yeah. your oysters. It's fine. It's more palatable than a fried oyster, which is weird. You'd think a fried oyster would be better. I love both. <laughs> but um, enjoy it. <laughs> Our stomach's full. We left the restaurant and stopped at a nearby campground for the night. In the morning, we heard the sounds of summer in the air and reflected on the southern environment. This whole place feels super nostalgic because one, it feels like summer, which is something that I haven't felt in a long time. And not only just like the way it looks, but also the sights and the smells and the sounds. But at the same time, it's like, since we're in the deep south, there's this like slight mystery to it because I'm hearing all these like animal sounds that I don't recognize. I'm seeing trees that don't look too familiar. The constant fear of gators coming up to you at night. Yeah, and it, it uh, adds to this like sort of mysticism, which in a way makes it even more nostalgic. Because when you have nostalgic memories, you just it's this like hazy representation of what summer is. Mm -hmm. That's what this feels like. This is the bluest sky I've ever seen in my life. The green here, so different than the red sands of Monument Valley. Yeah, I was thinking as we were driving through the Southwest, will this sort of landscape look unique to me again? Because I've also been out in California for two extra weeks, and in a sense it kind of does. I mean, it's very familiar, but it's also, it is really strange to see this sort of, what we would consider in Ohio as summer, mm -hmm. to see this sort of landscape right now. All right, well, we got one last leg of the journey. You guys ready? Let's do it. Yep. Let's do it. Sure. Now, it was about a seven hour drive to Nashville, Tennessee. As we drove into town, we saw billboards advertising honky-tonks and the famous Batman skyscraper. And today we were having some delicious Nashville hot chicken with our friend Tim Lawson and his daughter Abby. Of course, when you order hot chicken, you have to make sure you choose the right level of spicy. Mm, the spice is just right for what I picked. <laughs> Tim's good so far. <laughs> Usually I get the, the highest spice level at a restaurant. This time I didn't because the last time I tried that, a disaster happened in my stomach. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> so I got the hot, which is two levels below the hottest. And it's very delicious and a perfect amount of spice. Just enough kick without an hour of pain afterwards. <laughs> After our meal, we wandered around town and Tim showed us pictures from one of his recent backpacking trips. We took a walk to the Vanderbilt campus to digest all the food we had eaten. And we had some fun goofing around while we explored. <laughs> and I jumped on the opportunity to look for some wild edible plants. Irregular flowers. Kind of like a mild vegetable taste. Tastes like a, it's like a raw green bean. It's used to call rabbit grass. Rabbit grass? That's kind of what it tastes like. Well, it's not really sour, but it has that little... Like a slight mm -hmm. sweetness or something. Yep. Yeah. What about the pea pods? Can you eat those? You know, probably. Right now, definitely not. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, desiccated pea pods. So this is American linden or basswood. And you can just eat the tender leaves just like that. You want to try, anyone? This kind of tastes like edamame to me. But they do taste like edamame. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. After a delightful afternoon, we parted ways with Tim and Abby and made our way to a friend's place to stay the night. Before turning in, we went to Broadway, Nashville's famous honky-tonk street. Like Batman. We enjoyed some fantastic live country music which would challenge anybody who says they generally don't enjoy country. Maybe I do like country, it's not bad at all. And we had some drinks before calling it a night. The next day, 
we were on our way back home. We'd spend the final night of our road trip here, in Evansville, Indiana. How was it? It's literally exactly I mean, what you think it would be. Woo! It just so happened that my cousins and family friends were having a cookout today. It was great to hang out and wind down with some familiar faces. Food was being prepared inside, and we were all excited to eat. Okay, so we've got good old Derek. And oh my goodness, look what's happening over here. You already know what it is, family. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pile of wood that needs to be burned. All we had to say was, Andrew, there's a pile of wood that needs to be burned. And he said, say no more, I'm on it. How's it feel, Thomas? It feels like the Midwest. I mean, it's, I'm not home, but it feels like home. That's for sure. Well, I mean, it is literally home for you. It is literally home for me. It's your family, I've never met these people before. But I've seen them. Yeah, I've, I've seen, seen them. them. And, and they've seen you, like they probably know a lot. For some reason they've seen me, I'm sorry that they've been there. <laughs> the burgers had all been prepped, and on the grill were some marinated chicken kebabs. As the food continued sizzling, we all continued goofing off and joking around. Stand up! We must go back! Oh, oh perfect burger! Uh, next month. Why do I feel like I'm being filmed? Yes, you are. <laughs> Dope. Evansville is an interesting place. I like to call it the nexus of the universe. It has the population of a city, but the fact that everybody seems to know each other and is super friendly makes you think that it's a small town. You can get your shish kebab now. Oh, hey, the fire's done. On guard. Yeah, the fire is burning pretty hard right now. Good thing we have it's good wind the... out there. Good thing I have all five the... dead cypress trees. <laughs> <laughs> we had all gotten to know each other in the past, whether it was through video games, camping, or just hanging out. And we couldn't think of a more fitting end to our long journey across the U.S. As the crowd thinned out and people went off to sleep, we decided to sit around the campfire one more time. But what a great ending to the trip this was. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. And that's what Andrew and I were talking about. It was just, this is the perfect way to end it. It was just relaxing with friends and family and just... A warm welcome back to the Midwest. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Or as warm as it could be. <laughs> <laughs> it was warm earlier. <laughs> Man, this is the last official night of the road trip, though. It like, really that's, is. Yeah. Yeah. It's been over two weeks since you guys flew out to L.A. I don't know, it's just weird it's that really hard to we believe. drove the whole yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. you guys drove flew. across the US. Yeah. You know, it, I was telling Robbie earlier, when you make that drive, it really makes the U.S. feel a lot smaller. When you're in that car, though, you see the changes. Yeah. You observe every little tree that goes by. It's not just like, oh, look, it's red here, it's green here. Mm -hmm. There's desert here, there's trees here. Everything kind of just like has a purpose and you can see that transition as you go across the country. Yeah. <sighs> well, I think this road trip has tested our friendship and I think it's proven pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like <laughs> any more time, maybe not so much, but, <laughs> but the fact that we've lasted this long, it's like, damn. Yeah. What was your each of your favorite parts of the road trip? I think I really enjoyed that first night in the Alabama hills. First of all, it was beautiful. But second of all, it was like the first night out after Big Sur. Mm -hmm. So I was like really excited to be able to sleep in a dry thing and just be able to see the stars mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. The Southwest was great, but I think of ultimately Louisiana took the cake for me. And just first being on that plantation and like having that nice cottage to stay in after several nights of camping and like dingy motels and being able to like warm up in that hot tub with some mint julep. <laughs> And then the next day going canoeing, having a great meal with like delicious food. I don't know, anything with canoes and good food takes the cake for me. And also hot tubs are one of my favorite things. <laughs> All they needed to have was a charcuterie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard for me to pin down one favorite moment. I want to say Angel's Landing though. Yeah. I think that might have, I mean you guys didn't get to experience that, but man, it was really something else to get to the top of there after going up like these chains mm -hmm. and then getting to see the whole valley below. And it literally looked like some sort of bizarre world Yosemite. Yeah, it was wow. really cool. But This is kind of a cop-out answer, but my favorite part of the road trip was driving. I loved getting in the car 
and then just driving and seeing the scenery change. I think my favorite drive was from Zion to Monument Valley. Mm, that was cool. Yeah. And you know how much distance we covered and the mesas that we saw. I'm, I'm going to say Monument Valley was my favorite because <laughs> the sun went down. It was a violently windy night, and then we woke up the next morning. You could just see because of how flat everything is. You could just see how the Earth rotates and the sun stays still and you can just see the sun rise on like the exact opposite side over that view. It was beautiful. One thing we're forgetting is all the awesome people we met. And like uh, tonight, oh, more yeah. than anything, is a great reminder of that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, first we met everybody at the LA meetup. Oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah, you're right. And then, yeah, Warren. Warren Fernandez. James uh, Blackburn. James, James Blackburn. Blackburn. James Blackburn was such a good time. The Parkers. Parkers, Parkers, Parkers that were awesome. Tim V, the Texan camera. Yeah, also awesome. <laughs> And then uh, Tim Lawson. Tim yeah, Tim Lawson. Lawson. Man, and great his daughter. guy. Yes. Yeah. Then the family. Yeah. yeah. The original bunch of hooligans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, guys. One more night. The last official night of the road trip. Let's yeah. do it. Put out this fire, Andrew. What Made a journey. It. it had been a long journey. All the way from Los Angeles, Camping in the rain at Big Sur, exploring California's wilderness. Gambling in Las Vegas, driving all across the Southwest, and hiking and paddling all around the South. Now, back in the Midwest, we were surrounded by familiar friends and family. But we had also made so many friends along the way. It's easy to see the problems in the world and assume that it's a dangerous place full of dangerous people. But if our journey had taught us anything, it's that no matter where you adventure, you'll find people who are incredibly hospitable, genuine, and caring. And if all of us get together, overcome our differences, and cooperate, that's when we can learn from our past and create a better future. At the end of a long journey, it felt good to get off the road, return home, and finally recuperate. But there are still so many places left to see and so many people to meet. Before long, we'd be back in the wilderness to archive even more of our adventures. It's not about giving everything away. It's not about being selfish either. It's about finding that balance. As T. Bryce Ryan always said, keep sharing and caring. And Jason Bourgeois wants to give a shout out to his brother. Sean! 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 Bourgeois. Marty, read this piece of paper for me. Uh, oh, okay, Rick. Um, this looks like a receipt to Lowe's. Shut up, Marty. It's a piece of paper. It says, um, shout out to John Truitt, Philip and Jessica Liu, and James Pruitt would like to give a shout out to Adventure Archives for keeping the adventure alive. Now, now do we have to go back in time and go... 88 uh, miles per hour? Are we gonna have enough road to do that? Marty, where we're going, we don't need roads. If it's where's you need, Khajiit has them. Tell me about the hidden scroll you have there. Ah, the sacred scroll from Tuck and Coop. Send this to my cousin in Avalon. I've come from a land far away to deliver this urgent message from Tuck and Coop. Ah, yes. It says, Happy birthday, Tucker. Also, 
Shout outs to Expedition Research LLC, Jacob Milliken, Trails We Hike, and Eric Locker. And a shout out to Norman Mountjoy, Charlie Joe, Joe Fender, Anne McBride, Jim Potts, and Hong Long. Thank you. It has been real. It has been fantastic. Thank it's been you. awesome. And we will see each other again. Yes, we sure I'm will. Sure. To all the people who know State Parkers but don't know Adventure Archives, please check them out. Subscribe. On no, everything. no, no, no. Check out State Parkers and subscribe and Patreon and comment and like and subscribe. <laughs> what are you waiting for? <laughs> So we are back, well I'm back, these poor souls still have an extra three hours to go. It feels incredible to be home. My condolences to these guys. Well, hope to not see you guys for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> see you next lifetime. <laughs> the Adventure Archives okay, is over. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, yeah, all good? Good. yeah. Thomas has been in LA. <laughs> 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 